today on the Self Smarter Podcast. And so it's those three themes, the fact that she was asked to give the speech and she wanted to show up differently. The fact that, you know, she started to see the analogy of the wolf and the wolf pack and the importance of, of, of the impact that they have on the environment and really society in this particular instance, Yellowstone, but she thought of it in a broader sense relative to women in this case, showing up together and making a difference. And then she thought about the 99 team. It was like old rule versus new rule. And so she used these inspirations to craft this nifty, nimble eight chapter book. Hi, we're Danelle and Megan, the hosts of this conversation centric podcast for leaders seeking to be better every day. Whether you choose to be a leader in the workplace, at home, or in your community, we believe the most effective leaders are equipped to not only be self starters, but self smarter. Hello, and welcome to Self Smarter. I'm Megan, and this is my co host, Danelle. Hello, everyone. So we're, we're both jazzed up today. Yes. We have big plans tonight. We do. What are we, we going to do? do? Before we get into this amazing episode that I know we're both excited about, yes. we are going out as a company tonight to celebrate our milestones. We do this each month and we're going to, it's going to be an elevated version this evening. We have a lot to celebrate as a company. We do. Uh, we have some birthdays. We have uh, some incredible an- work anniversaries, mm-hmm. including yours mm-hmm. of 15 years. Mm-hmm. So we are going to be celebrating that. We're celebrating a new engagement uh, for Jesse and her fiance, Will. And then our dear Hannah and her husband, Luke, are expecting their, our first, uh, our, our first, first DMA, DMA baby. baby. Yes, there's possession there. And we found out <laughs> this weekend, or they found out and shared with us that it's going to be a baby boy. So maybe we'll have some naming games tonight as Ooh, well. That's that could a good be idea. fun. Yeah. Naming games, yeah. And uh, we have two graduations. Yes. Miss Marcy's um, oldest, Abigail, is graduating high school. By the time this thing has aired, she will have a high school graduate and I will have a college graduate. So we just have lots to celebrate. It's going to be a fun night of uh, starting off with sushi and then some karaoke. I know. I Yay. can't imagine a better way to celebrate. And especially with you <laughs> leading us tonight through the night, we're yeah. going to have some karaoke. It's going to be For so sure. much fun. So do you have a list of songs that you're wanting to sing tonight? Yes, I'm a professional. Well, don't tell us what it is. Okay. Okay. Oh, because well, I want to save that till the end. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in our music moment, but right. I, I know that you, you always have a lineup and I know you've been thinking about it. So <laughs> I would love for you to share with our listeners. So be thinking about that. Okay. Okay. All right. So... I'm freaking out. I'm really freaking out emotionally because we've been preparing for this. Mm -hmm. We've read a book called Wolfpack. Yes. And it's an amazing book. Will you tell us a little bit about it? Just super high level. And then we'll, I want to share something else. Okay. So essentially it's, well, it's not her first book, but it's a book by Abby Wambach and it's called The Wolfpack and it was basically inspired and I'll, I'll give a little bit more detail on this in a second, but it was basically inspired by a speech she gave at a commencement address and what she's done is she's taken lessons that she didn't necessarily learn on the field, but has since learned since she's been off the field and she's put it into this incredibly compact, which are my favorite books, the thin yes. ones. And that it is an incredible fast read. You can read it in an hour because the audible books, I think an hour and 10 minutes tops. Yes. And it is a book on an old way of thinking and how to change our mindsets. And it's incredible leadership lessons. It has a lot to do with culture. It has a lot to do. It's, it's, it's definitely geared to towards women but she even says at the beginning of the book that she wants this to be a book for everybody Um, but she can't help but write it in that particular vein so it's just a a wonderful book that surprisingly I I thought it was going to be more about her career right and and of course the stories are in that vein but the way she tees up these lessons they're so digestible and memorable that I think this is one of the most underrated leadership books out there well it was until, of course, Brene Brown talked about it, literally talked about it and said she feels like it, it's one of the most right. influential books that she's ever read. So and I know I that meant a lot to Abby. I agree. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the genesis of the book. Perfect. So those of you that do not know who Abby Wambach is, mm-hmm. welcome. 
Um, she is a soccer legend, a speaker, an activist, and New York Times bestselling author of this book that we're highlighting today, which is called Wolfpack. I'd really, really like to share, just before we get into our discussion, I think for those of you listening, I, I would like to pump you up and get you where D and I are because we yes. watched this that we watched this clip prior to starting this podcast today. So let's roll the clip. It's four minutes, so hang tight. We'll be right back. David, please roll the clip. U.S. attacking here. Here's Wambach opportunity. U.S. goes up 1-0 in her first start. Abi Wambach has hit the back of the net here in the seventh minute. That moment was life-changing, not because it was easy, but because it gave me the passion and the motivation to continually to want to do it. 1-1 game, the gold medal match. Rolling on, far side. Headed by Wambach, and Wambach has scored! USA leads! Well, that's it. USA have won the gold medal. It's so fitting that it's Abby Wambach that scores that winning goal. She's the player that's going to take the torch and carry the United States into the next era. Just her knack for scoring goals and scoring big goals and showing up in those big moments has been tremendous her whole career. I mean, she's got a million goals. It's crazy. does it the right way. She's invested every single day, every single practice. The standards at which she sets are extremely high, and that's why the team is as successful as they are. And it will go down as the USA's worst performance ever in the Women's World Cup. Three minutes of additional time. There is still life for the United States. It just takes one chance. I just kept holding my finger up. One chance, that's it. Rapino gets the crossing. It's towards Wombat. Oh, can you believe this? Abby Wombat has saved the USA's life in this World Cup. In the end, losing in penalties in the final of the World Cup is a heartbreaker, but I do feel like we got so much uh, excitement on back here in the States and couldn't be prouder. We broke into the hearts of the people that are in our country and even around the world. That game grew so many fans for this team. All talk of redemption this week after that World Cup final defeat. Slides into one back. What a magnificent opening goal. 141st in international soccer for Abby Wombach. It's all over. Redemption for the United States. They've come back to win the gold medal against Japan at Wembley Stadium in London 2012. I, I never thought. Abby would reach 158. It, it, it really is something special given her trajectory and some of the obstacles she's had to overcome along the way. Oh, driven across the walls. Come back! History is made! Goal number 159! It's the international scoring record! It's never easy to say goodbye, you always want to go out on top, you always want there to be that fairy tale like ending. I hope that this is it, not just for me, but for this entire group of women who have shown me the way, who have taught me about myself, who have made me soul search and find out more about who I am and who I want to be. When she comes in in any role she's going to play, she's a great leader because that's what the team is feeding off of. And you can see it. First 10 minutes, we get a goal. Let's go. 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 let us go let us go we had a dream, and in my opinion, all the women up here on this stage believed in that dream, and I believe that that is the reason why we won this World Cup, is because none of us ever stop believing, and neither should you guys. The best part about this whole thing is that, you know, when I walk away and the team turns the page and moves on, that's what's supposed to happen. They have to move on because I want them to leave the game better than they found it. Woohoo! <laughs> USA! I mean, USA! <laughs> Seriously, like, it, it doesn't get old. 
Never. Does not get old. So amazing. So well done. And she's just such an inspiration just for people. Like you said earlier, it right. doesn't have to be women. She's a super badass. Yes, I just she have is. to say it. Yes. So let's dive into the book a little bit. Okay. So again, such a great read. Anyone don't have to be a woman, anyone who loves soccer, who loves, I mean, I'm thinking about people with children in athletics, people who are athletes themselves, people who are in a leadership position, people who are on a self smarter journey, especially people with daughters in sports. Yes. And there's actually, the, there's this, this book would be fine for high schoolers and above to read, but there's a, there's a specific version for younger children. Right. Now I haven't read that, but, um, I did wanted to point that out that when you go to Amazon and I, and I hope that you will, um, you can see that there's an, another version of a the version, book out there. Yeah. Version. Yeah. yeah. We're working from the, the one with the white cover. There's one with a black cover. That's the children's version. We're working with the one from the white cover just as an FYI. So tell us a little bit more about the book, Danelle and the themes that surfaced for you. Okay. So what she, what she talks about at the beginning of the book. And again, the book is it's so digestible and I don't want to give away too much, but the essence of this episode is to really cover the book and to get, you know, to get you interested in, in like we are yeah. and, and, and reading it and learning from it. But she talks about at the beginning of the book, there's basically three inspirations that helped her shape this particular book. And she was asked to give a speech at a commencement address post career. And she was shocked to be among others that had spoke at this particular college yeah. uh, and it was all women's school. And so she was, I mean, in the likes of Barack Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton and Sheryl Sandberg and the list goes on and on. And so she found herself thinking like these women are walking into this auditorium as students and they're leaving as women into the world, what do I share with them to make an impact on them? So she really started to think about that. And she said, you know, obvious, the obvious reason why she was asked to give the speech is because she's one of the greatest athletes of our time, yes. definitely soccer, but I, I would argue athletes of Absolutely. our time. And so she knew that that was the case, but she wanted to show up in a more meaningful way than just her accolades on the field. So she really started to think about lessons and leadership. And she was inspired. So the second, I guess, inspiration that happened while she was thinking about what am I, I've got to write this speech. Mm -hmm. She had recently had seen a TED Talk on wolves and their return to Yellowstone. Which is so interesting. So interesting. Yes. And I don't, I will be honest with you, I might have skipped over that particular TED Talk, but Abby has taught me even the things that don't necessarily jump off the page, they might be worth your while. Anyway, so it was about the wolves. And again, it, it's, it's eloquently laid out in the opening, but it talks about when the, the wolves had been absent or been not in Yellowstone Park for over 70 years. So in 1995, they, they started to bring the wolves back. And the park found, was so revitalized because the wolves had, their absence was missed. There was a, there was a, they were, they were meant to be there. They That's were right. meant to be there as a pack and they had major influence on the ecosystems of the entire park from the animals to the vegetation. And again, I won't give it all away, but cause she lays it out beautifully. And so then there was, she started to think about the impact of the wolves and she started to align that with what she experienced in her career and what she could share with these these graduating women. And then she also started to think about the 1999 women's national team. So this is before she became, she was called up to nationals and they went to a FIFA, this 1999 national team. And they said, we want to, we want to play in stadiums like the men do. Okay. So they said, absolutely not. You won't sell it out. And they went on this grassroots campaign, yeah. not knowing if they were going to make it to the finals of the World Cup, mind you. Right. But they did. They believed in themselves. And they believed not only in their ability to be in the finals of the World Cup that was in the USA, by the way, played in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. They believed they could sell out that stadium. And again, I'm not going to give it away, but what they did to sell out that stadium 90,000 people. It's one of the largest sporting events of all time. And it, she started to realize that those women 
they were taught to think a certain way. Mm -hmm. They were told, no, women do not sell out stadiums, particularly in soccer. Mm -hmm. That was the old way of thinking. The new, they turned that on its ear, this, as she calls them, these visionary group of women who put their ego aside and said, no, we are going to do this. And they started to think differently about themselves. They didn't need someone else to tell them how to think or really how, how the script should be written. They rewrote it. And so it's those three themes, the fact that she was asked to give the speech and she wanted to show up differently. The fact that, you know, she started to uh, see the analogy of the wolf and the wolf pack and the importance of, of, of w the impact that they have on the environment and really society in this particular instance, Yellowstone, but she thought of it in a broader sense relative to women in this case, showing up together and making a difference. And then she thought about the 99 team. It was like old rule versus new rule. And so she used these inspirations to craft this nifty, nimble, eight-chapter book that is so incredibly inspirational. So that's the genesis of the book. Yeah, and it's, it's again, why listen to this book? Why listen to or read mm -hmm. Wolfpack now? Because it is so inspirational on so many levels. It hits on so many leadership notes. It's such an easy read. That's exactly why you need to be doing it. So we're going to talk about those new roles yes, and those old roles, mm -hmm. really old roles and then new roles. But really what we're hoping that you're able to do while listening to us sort of review this book and give you the highlights is be excited about reading it yourself because we will never be able to give away, <laughs> give the passion that, that Abby gives no. in her words and the stories she tells that align with each of the anecdotes, which Janelle is going to talk about a little bit, are tremendously helpful just yes. and, uh, and just inspirational so let's talk about those um those chapters and let's let's get into it if that's okay yeah let's dive in all right so chapter one so the the title of chapter one is you are always the wolf mm -hmm. the old role is stay on the path the new role is create your own path yeah so she starts off the book talking about I mean, the time old tell of Little Red Riding Hood. And I think we all know how that tell goes. She was given very ex explicit directions, yep. instructions. And when she decided to go off the path, literally the wolf comes out and all hell breaks loose. And so, you know, the, the lesson here is stay on the path. Don't ever break the rules. And in some cases in life, that's probably the right a thing to do, move. a good move. <laughs> but in this instance, Abby uses it as... A, a way to show us that we can think beyond what we've been told. The perfect example was the 99 na women's national soccer team. And she talks about how inside every one of us is a wolf and it's a good thing. And when we do need to venture off the path that we've been given in many instances, and I love what she says here, um, every good thing that has come to me and the women I respect has happened when we dared to venture off the path. And so the rest of the chapter, she gives examples about that. And I just think, in, and she ends the chapter with, um, again, there is a wolf inside of every woman, we could say person here. Um, and the wolf is who we are made of before the world told, told us to be. And I think that's, that's the genesis of this chapter is who we are versus who want who someone tells us to be. And, you know, our wolf is our talent. It's our power, our dreams, our voice, our curiosity, our courage, our dignity, and our choices. And it's our truest identity is really what the wolf is. And so I think she kicks off, you know, this book in chapter one, really setting the stage for what the quote unquote wolf is and kind of takes that stereotype of it being you know, maybe an, an aggressive, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, idol in this instance. And she, she turns that thinking and, and kind of prepares us for the rest of the book. And so I think the opening is, is, is fantastic. And it so. is. I also think, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you are, you, you're a wolf, you're, you are a wolf, you have a wolf inside <laughs> of you for sure, because no one has to tell you 
I think you, you, you know, people have to tell people, people can't help but tell them what to do, Mm -hmm. but you'd have a choice. Mm -hmm. And at one point in your career, you chose to go on your new path. And here we are. It's the company that employs us today Mm -hmm. because of your vision, because of that power, that, that wolf inside of you told you there was something different for you. And Mm -hmm. that's exactly what you set out to do. So any entrepreneur listening, anybody that's paving a new path or something uncharted that's scary, it's probably a good thing. I think that's what Abby's trying to elevate. Absolutely. And not to say that there's you're not going to be met with resistance or even failure. And we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But I think following the rules to which you've been, again, told, that's not told yeah. is not, we've got to rethink these things. Yeah. And in some cases, walking across the street when cars are coming is probably a good rule to follow. That's right. However, there are so many things in life and especially in leadership and in business where we can really rethink things. I mean, we, we have a lot of context to help us do that today. And that's what she's encouraging here is a different way of thinking. That's right. So she kicks us off in a really good mood in Mm -hmm. a really good fashion. Then we move to chapter two, which is be grateful Mm -hmm. and ambitious. The old role, she says, be grateful for what you have. The new rule, be grateful for what you have and demand what you deserve. Absolutely. And she basically talks about in this chapter, her being recognized at the ESPYs with the Icon Award. And Icon Award, and that's like the, the, the biggest award of, of every year of the ESPYs. And she was on stage being recognized with the late Kobe Bryant yeah. and Peyton Manning. Mm-hmm. And they had all retired. And she was standing on that stage with a grateful heart, so incredibly honored to be there on her own and on her own merit, but next to these incredible Hall of Fame, top of their game uh, athletes. And then she started to realize as the films and the, and, and again, the footage that Meg shared earlier was from the ESPYs, what they showed about her. And she realized very quickly as she stood next to them, that their careers had so much in common, but their futures post their retirements looked very differently. So she realized in this moment that they were at a point to where they could start to probably relax a little, if you think about monetarily. Yeah. And because if you think of male athletes pay <laughs> versus female. It, those two. Yeah, especially those two. And you think about the endorsements that come their way and just, you know, the the list goes on and on. And she realized that, whoa, their retirement is going to look very differently than mine. Meaning they could choose to be on coast. Neither one of them did. Yeah. But they could have chosen that path. And her hustle was just needing to start and thinking about it. She's been hustling her entire professional career. But when it came to her next, because she was a female athlete, Uh, that she had to think about things very differently. And so what she realized is that she was showing up on that stage the way she had showed up on the soccer field every single time, just with a grateful heart, proud to serve the USA, I mean, represent the USA, I should Mm -hmm. say, and serve in many ways, but just full of gratitude. And she let gratitude be where her emotions stopped about her ability her presence. Mm -hmm. And when she starts to talk about in this chapter, she introduces pay inequality and gives some very great facts around it. Some things that were really eye opening for me. Mm -hmm. And what she teaches us in this chapter is that we can be grateful and ambitious. We can use our success to elevate others and to, again, seek more that's then that it's been available to us. And I love what she says at the end of the book. She says, we can be grateful and brave. We can be grateful and ambitious, grateful and righteous, grateful and persistent, grateful for what you have. And we also need to demand what we deserve. And so I think just thinking about that, I, I think women, we can show up in this particular way. And not to say that men don't feel this way too. I just know as, as, as a woman who is largely surrounded by women leaders, I see us lead with gratefulness and we talk about humble leadership. There's nothing wrong with, you know, humility and it's, it's in fact, it's a good thing, but we, we can't be grateful and humble and fail to see 
the influence that we can particularly have and, and, and to want more. Again, she's talking about ambition here. That's right. So uh, anyway, just that's kind of the essence of that particular chapter. Yeah, a very, very good chapter and always with gratitude. You know, that was the big word that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. She's not trying to be greedy. No. What she's trying to say is, listen, give credit where credit's due. That's that's the the part about demand and demanding what you're deserved. That's what she's talking about. So it's, it's really, she explains it very well in the book. So highly recommend that you guys focus on chapter two there. Leaning into chapter three, which this might be one of my, this is definitely one of my top three of the chapters and you will see yourself in this or you won't mm -hmm. right lead yep. from the bench, the old role, wait for permission to lead mm -hmm. the new role lead now from wherever you are. Yes. I would say this is one of my top favorite too. And quite frankly, a lot of what we're trying to elevate by starting this podcast and what she talks about to tee up the chapter is that in her final season of her career, she was the captain and she sat down as they were looking at assembling the team. So there's obviously starters in soccer and then there's the bench that comes in and, and basically, you know, the, the, the second string and she knew it. She knew she was no longer in a position to be a starter and she had a, the humility and the care for her team to basically bench herself. And she made this decision along with the other coaches and what she talks about, and, and again, I won't give that away, but what she talks about ultimately taught her about being on the bench. She was more proud of the leader that she was in that season of being on the bench than she ever was the leader that she was literally as a starter on the field. And it's just so inspiring to, to think about and she says, if you're not a leader on the bench, you're not a leader anywhere. And I loved that. I loved to think about it in that way. We've talked about this in previous episodes, and I know we'll continue to talk about it, but it's, we don't need to wait to decide that we're leaders. And we don't, you know, it's not necessarily something we have to wait for someone to decide. It's something that we decide for ourselves. And she says that leadership is taking care of yourself and empowering others to do so. She said leadership is not a position to earn. It's an inherent power to claim. It's not the privilege of a few. It is the right and responsibility of all. And leader is not a title that the world gives you. It's an offering you give to the world. And I think if we can change our thinking around leaders instead of waiting, this is what she's encouraging us, don't wait for someone to give you permission to, give you permission to lead, yeah. lead from where you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so critical. And I, we have, you know, I think a lot of voices that we follow and, and thought leaders that we follow. Brene certainly talks about that. But I love the way Abby teased that particular mm -hmm. um the particular lesson up mm -hmm. and the examples that she used. And so uh, again, one of my favorite chapters as well as lead from the bench. Yeah. And leading from the bench in her position mm -hmm. as a form, well, she's always been a leader, but mm -hmm. in that position of expert expertise and mastery, mm -hmm. right. Leading mm -hmm. from the bench was probably not as uncomfortable as it could be from someone who is leading from a cubicle mm -hmm. or leading from the back of the room, mm -hmm. you know, but if you find yourself in those situations, you know, what are you going to say to motivate? Mm -hmm. What are you going to say to rally? What are you going to say to galvanize people in your space, mm -hmm. in a business or in a group setting or in a home uh -huh. to motivate different change moving forward, passing the ball forward. Right. So I think, you know, when I connect what she has to say and listening to you explain it, which I very much appreciate I try to put it into practical terms and thinking about, well, sure, Abby Wambach from the bench as a captain, there's expertise there. And even if you don't have the expertise, it's courage that she's right. asking you to have. Yeah, it's 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 volunteering yourself yeah. to have accountability and it's 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 raising your hand. And that can be in a very small way. I don't think any of us learn to be leaders with great responsibility without a lot of instances that 
smaller leadership opportunities that, that presented yeah. themselves that we either took advantage of or not. or not. And I think about, you know, what stood out to me, I've, re- I've read this book now three times and I, the first time I read it, I was nowhere in the mindset of even thinking about the, the opportunity that I had to turn over the day to day operations and, and name you president and have you run this company essentially. And, you know, reading that chapter again, preparing for this episode, you know, my role is I am essentially in, in many ways from the day to day perspective of the operations, I'm now the bench, I'm on the bench and it's, it's taking some getting used to as it did with her. But I, I saw myself in in this, in her story, Totally. totally different. And I was inspired by that because I'm, I'm learning to lead from the bench. Now, when it comes to strategy and other aspects of the business, I'm, I'm still out there on the field Yeah, absolutely. because you won't let me leave. (laughs) I keep trying to to run off. No, (laughs) (laughs) keep trying. Cut food grip. (laughs) Exactly. But I, you know, I I think thinking about it from, you know, a a different uh, mindset, just the season of my career. And that's what I want to offer to each of you. The seasons are going to change. And so that's what I love about this mm-hmm. book is there's different lessons and thank goodness it's an hour read because we can read it multiple times in a given year, that's particularly. Right. So I think it has lessons that continue to present itself as my point in that, in that ramble. They do. Yeah. And, and from a courageous perspective, what you're doing is very courageous. What she did was very courageous. And with courage, comes the opportunity for failure, which leads us into chapter four. It's Uh just beautifully thought through how she presented this, but chapter four is titled make failure your fuel. The old rule is failure means you're out of the game. The new rule is failure means you're finally in the game. Absolutely. So she starts off this chapter talking about the 95 world cup team. And she had a chance while she was, I guess, being groomed to go onto the national team to warm up with this group. And so they're in and out of, uh, not just warm up, but like practice with this team. And she, uh, noticed in the locker room that there was one picture hanging on the wall and it was of them being defeated, not winning, but being defeated by the Norwegian team, which I guess was a big rival at the time. And so over time she finally, got the courage to ask about the picture. And she said in the book that when she asked about it, that they started to explain that the first order of a national team business is to win. So the first order is to win, Mm -hmm. but that when failure does come, the team isn't afraid of it. In fact, the team is fueled by it. And the team never denies its last failure, which this picture symbolized, Mm -hmm. We don't reject it. We don't accept it as proof that we aren't worthy of playing at the highest level. And I just, I have chills, chills. And I think she realized, you know, in retrospect, using that is that she didn't need to spend her life transferring her fail. She wanted to transfer her failures into fuel versus letting them hang on her like some, you know, albatross. And she don't think she used that word, but um, she was she goes on to say that, you know, we tend to live by these old rules that say we don't get to show up until we're perfect. And so that can keep us, you know, we try to avoid failure because failure doesn't isn't fun. It's not fun at all. And she says, when we live afraid to fail, we don't take risk. We don't bring our entire selves to the table. So we end up failing before we ever begin. Yeah. And so, and then she talks about, which (laughs) I couldn't help but think of you, but she talks about how after she retired, she went into commentating for a very short lived time. Yes. As and she talks about when the red light of the camera comes on. Well, really, we she, could tie that back to both of us. I, <laughs> I thought fair, I fair. thought broadcasting was going to be my thing. Turns <laughs> out it wasn't so great. That video, yes, you oh deer in headlights. Yes. The minute the red light comes on, so we feel at we feel you, Abby. We do. We know. <laughs> we know how that feels. Um, but yet here we are. Yes, facing our fears, our fears. with these video cameras on each and every week yep. as we produce this podcast. Uh, but I love that she says, you know. Again, we need to take more risk and learn from our, our, our failures. And as Dolly says, I don't have failures. I just have a lot of lessons. And, um, so I think that 
that that part of this uh, particular chapter is beautiful. And she says that I could use this public failure, the commentating failure, because I mean, she was she was called out as being really, really bad. So she knew she was bad. But Twitter also reminded her of that. And she says, I could take from this experience that I was destined to be a failure or I could take could take from it that I wasn't. And she says that common that that commentating failure did not in my career. In fact, it helped me find my career. Mm. So I think that's the other lesson is, and that's what she means by fuel. Let our failures, re- think about them. Why was it a failure? What did I miss? What can I learn? And what can I pack in my backpack to take along with me on the next challenge that I find myself on. So again, another beautiful chapter, but, uh, which, you know, for you mm -hmm. as a leader leading me all these years, even when I was doubled over crying because I'd really messed up or I felt responsible for a failure of the business that the business had gone through. Yeah. I don't think you had a lot of mess ups through the years, but I mean, you've took on responsibility and accountability of things that didn't work out around here. That's very different than a mess up. I just want to clarify that. Okay. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But you would have the wherewithal pre Wolfpack, pre reading (laughs) Wolfpack. Like my point is, is that I was really like, call it hurt, call it feeling like a failure on the inside. Mm -hmm. You would have the wherewithal to say, now, what did we learn from this? Mm -hmm. I mean, and that always kind of brought me back like, oh, okay. This, this is a lesson. Right. You know, and I've thought about that because you said that to me before Mm -hmm. and and like, where did that come from in Mm -hmm. me? And I think it, I mean, I think it came from a place of, you know, again, growing up in, in, in a church environment where I learned about grace and mercy Mm -hmm. and the, a, the difference between the two, but that if you think about, again, I think there's different levels of that and I I don't want to take it out of context, but I just know like, okay, let's give someone the grace. And I, sometimes I wasn't giving it to myself. Right. And it was in many cases, it was easier for me to give you the grace to say, Hey, what did we learn from this? And it was even from myself. So, um, I think an important part of leadership is to create an environment where we can have quote unquote failures again, where there's not lives involved yes, yes. <laughs> and, and also where we have an environment to where we take risk mm-hmm. and we just know that there's going to be some mishaps along the way. And we almost invite them because we know that when we have them, we have the opportunity to grow and become stronger because of them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing that I learned on this journey that we've been on and it's why it's kind of ingrained in the way we think around here at DMA. Yeah. And I think for leaders, you know, Abby, call it, call it Abby's knowledge, call it Danelle's knowledge, (laughs) call it Dolly's knowledge, no matter what it's, it's knowledge worth applying within your group, within your wolf pack. Yep. Yeah. All right. Chapter five, champion each other. The old role is be against each other. The new role be for each other. Yes. And I think this is something that, you know, again, she's speaking to everyone, but this is definitely something that I think, you know, she's really calling out for women. Mm -hmm. And, and, and she begins by saying, you know, to show up like a champion is when you can see beyond yourself. And she talks about, if you go and look at every goal, which by the way is 184, I think she holds the record for both women and men Mm -hmm. scored goals on the field. Mm -hmm. And she says, when she says, if you go look at every film footage of every one of my goals, she says, watch what I do afterwards. Mm -hmm. And she talks about the pointing and she says, you know, when you're not scoring, not everyone's going to be the ball scorer when the score is made, you better be rushing toward the person that made the score. And then she says, if you look at my film footage, who am I pointing at? She's like, I'm pointing at the person who had passed me the ball, the, you know, the the defense, the person on defense that allowed us to get 
to the other side of the field. I'm not the best with soccer knowledge. Yeah. The, the people mm-hmm. on the bench, the coach that came up with the play mm-hmm. and, and the list goes on and on. And she's like, you, we have to celebrate each other's success. And we have to realize that we didn't get there alone. And, you know, I love that. She says, I never scored a goal in my life without getting a pass from someone else. Right. I was like, I hadn't even thought about that. Like she, got a pass that made her score the goal. And for her to have that insight, um, and she says, you know, when you score, you better be pointing and thinking about what did I do? So when you have that win, even if it's a small win around your office or on your athletic team or in your community, be thinking about others when you're feeling that success. And I I love how she says that, um, you know, and what she talks about relative to women is she says, you know, it can be difficult for us to do this because we pinned it against, pinned it against each other for so long. Yeah. And so, and she talks about scarcity. She says, scarcity has been planted inside of us and among us. This is not our fault, but it is our problem to solve. Yeah. And so when I think about that, and I know, um, and, and we're, and I just take this chance to, to talk about, this is episode 16, but in episode 14, we had our first guest, Raina Nelson came on and one of the things that, and again, just really appreciate all the feedback. And if you haven't listened to that episode, please, Mm -hmm. please listen to it. Her story is incredible. And we just had an amazing time um, with our first guest, but we talked about the roles of bridge leaders and what Abby's calling to us in this book is those of us who are in leadership positions and have accepted that is that it's our job to change this mindset, especially for women around scarcity. And she says that power and success and joy are not pies. Pies as being the thing we eat. A bigger slice for one woman doesn't mean a smaller slice for another. And you could plug in men there as well. Sure. And she says, we believe that love, justice, success, and power are infinite and meant to be accessible to all. And she says, that's how the wolf pack shows up. And so the lesson here is that, you know, we need to find ways to champion each other. And that when we do, that doesn't mean we're dimming our own light or our own success, but we're shining a a collective brighter light. That's right. So um, again, just another beautifully uh, eloquent chapter of lessons. Yep. And it's really humility. It is. It's about, you know, champion the person who helps you with the assist Mm -hmm. who assists you in the win and it happens all the time in at least in our business Mm -hmm. you know we can't make a big we can't close a big client or make a big win from an analytics perspective or get the results that we want without multiple people involved absolutely so pointing the finger at the people who are making those wins happen for our company is something that we do and that's part of what we're going to do tonight absolutely we're going to be doing lots of finger pointing especially (laughs) When I'm pointing at y'all to get on stage and sing with me. And our team hasn't read this book yet. I think maybe a couple have, but they're going to be like, God, what's going on with all the finger pointing? (laughs) We can't wait. All right. So then chapter six, which is as a result of the humility, you then come into power. It's called demand the ball. Old rule, play it safe and pass the ball, which is what you're taught from a very young age. Mm -hmm. If you've ever played sports or you have a child in sports, that's what everybody says. Pass the ball. New rule, demand the ball. Right. And so she starts this chapter uh, talking about Michelle Akers, which is one of her um, her all-time sports heroes. And she talks about uh, how she... Michelle was practicing with their team and they were playing a game. And, and again, I won't, I won't go into it because I really want you to hear it from her voice. But what she talks about is how Michelle in, in a given instance, once she realized her team, the team that she was playing on was losing this particular, again, just a casual game of soccer back and forth scoring. She took over and she took over and said, and demanded the ball. Yes. And, and again, that's the name of the chapter and a, a beautiful, beautiful story. And what she realized was that, you know, it, she talks about feeling like she learned, she says every time she thinks about Michelle doing what she did and illustrating in that moment, how she took over the game and then her team ended up winning. She says, I'm tempted to 
Every time she says, I think about Michelle, every time I'm tempted to decide that I'm unworthy, unprepared, incapable and incapable and not good enough. And so she uses this lesson from Michelle. Again, it's a, it's a pretty simple thing that happened, but she uses it when she's feeling doubtful. And then she goes on to talk about, you know, starting her life with Glennon and Glennon had three children. And so Abby really doubted if she could show up as, as, as the kids call her the bonus mom, but show up in a way, not in, having, having been a parent, how could I show up for these three amazing children? And, um, she says, you know, you sometimes have to show up before you're ready to demand the ball. And she talks about showing up and what she's realized is that she is showing up for her family and her kids. And if she wanted to spend her life with Glennon, she was going to have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And what Glennon and I, well, I agree a hundred percent with what Glennon and her wife encouraged her is like, Oh, by the way, parenting, it doesn't matter what type of parent or guardian you are. That's what comes along with it. It is a constant feeling of self doubt. Mm -hmm. And you can find yourself in that moment at any given day, any given morning, any given evening is that is inherent. And so, you know, Abby was motivated by that and, and, and says, yeah, it's not easy, uh, being, being the bonus mom, but it's certainly worth it. And she takes from those lessons. And she says at the end of the chapter, in the end, owning and unleashing all your power, isn't just about you. It's also about the domino effect. Mm -hmm. When you stand up and demand the ball, you give others the permission to do so. And I think that's so powerful and it's, um, it kind of ties back in as a team this week and in, in our weekly team talk, we talked about Brene's third part of her book, uh, Atlas of the Heart on making meaningful connections. And I loved, she introduced three, basically three concepts for creating meaningful connections. And in one of those, she reintroduces power as being a good thing. She certainly beautifully talks about examples of power being misused, but she says we've, because it's been so misused, we sometimes don't lean into power as being a great tool. As Abby says here, when you stand up and demand the ball, you give other per, others permission. So when we stand in our own power, we're giving others the opportunity and the inspiration to do so. And she gives she talks about MLK and Martin Luther King and how he defined power. And he defines it as the ability to achieve purpose and affect change. And that was one of the biggest highlights that, you know, we talked about as a team this week of that particular section of the book. And I just think when we think about, you know, I, I remember getting to chapter six and demand the ball and sometimes demand you know, I kind of have a funky relationship with that. And certainly power has been one of the things that I've struggled with. But I just really appreciate how Abby Brene and quite frankly, Martin Luther King have teed up the, uh, I guess, a mindset around power because we can just talk about how the abuse of it and yes. how it can be misused. Yes. And I think we need to think about it within ourselves as being something that is something we need to lean into more. Right. Using it for good, using, using your power, it, yes. which is what you did when you started this business. You decided I'm going to use my passion and my power to be able to lead a group of people and take this risk mm -hmm. so that we can increase demand of things that are good for people to eat, fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so you have learned that you demanded the ball and then you've taught us to take the ball mm -hmm. and demand the ball for ourselves. Absolutely. So you know, what does that look like around here for, for the two of us? That's what that looks like mm. for other people on the team who are just coming up in their careers. It looks like, let me, let me do that. Let, yeah. Let me, let me, let me kick that off. Or, and we've given this example multiple times and I need to probably come up with some more, but Jordan raising her hand say, I, I want to, I let's do this podcast. Let's, let's do this. And we have so many day-to-day -day examples, but I think that's most relatable to our listeners. And I, so that's what taking the ball you know, demanding the ball can look like. It doesn't always have to be this big thing, big thing. Like yeah. you gave the example of me starting this company. That was definitely a, a large example, at least for me. But I think it, it can happen in so many smaller ways yes. if we're just thinking about the opportunity that it gives. And if we're in a, an environment where 
taking the ball doesn't always mean we're going to score. That's right. That's okay. That's okay. And I think that is also a critical part in how these chapters and lessons all tie together. Yeah. And I love the little moments. So like with your, the quote that you mentioned with Martin Luther King, Mm -hmm. to achieve purpose and effect change, that's Mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and as leaders listening to this, that's what you're trying to do. Ultimately, yeah. at the end of the day, you're trying to win for a business, but really you're affecting change in the mm-hmm. world through the goodness that you're doing in your leadership mm-hmm. by giving people the ball so that they can continue to affect change. And that is legacy. Absolutely. Okay. So transitioning to chapter seven, bring it all. Old rule, lead with dominance, create followers. New rule, lead with humanity, cultivate leaders. Yeah. Yum. I, I, this is absolutely one of my favorite chapters. Yes. And she talks about how um, on the national team, they, they had a, named a new head coach. And the new head coach was from Norwegia. And she came in and she definitely talked about, I mean, th- the team was already super successful. But she says, we're going to build on that. And you've basically done it through your physical dominance mm-hmm. on the field. But we're going to learn to win more creatively and we're going to win more with innovation and steady sureness. And so, you know, the team was kind of, okay, like listening and really taking this in. And then all of a sudden, this is my favorite part. She whips out a guitar and she plays <laughs> and begins to sing the times they are a changing by Bob, Bob Dylan. And Abby was like, we absolutely had no idea what she was doing. And she, they, they were all, happen. no, they were all thinking the same thing. We are so screwed. <laughs> so can you imagine this lady? Like, no. just, they don't know her. They're the new head coach. They're the, there's, they're this dominant successful team. And she whips out a guitar. And I mean, that song's kind of, I don't know. It's a little dreary. I would have been like, what Uh-oh. in the hell is this? Uh-huh. I would have been right there with Abby and the team. Same. But what she goes on to say, and I think it's so poignant. She realized, as did the rest of the team, this was the first time many of them had ever seen a leader be vulnerable. So think about Yikes. that for a moment. Yeah. So this woman was introducing vulnerability, which is one of the greatest lessons and our greatest sign of courage yes. is vulnerability. Yes. And she goes on to say that real leaders know who they are and bring every bit of themselves to whomever they lead. Real leaders don't mimic a cultural construct of what a leader looks like, sounds, and acts like. They understand that there are as many authentic ways to lead as there are people. And that, my friends, is going to be potentially a new tattoo. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, get that tattoo. I mean, well, that's a little long. We're going to have to paraphrase that now. Both arms but up and down. I love it. That she says leaders understand that there are as many authentic ways to lead Mm -hmm. as there are people. And that goes back to all of us can choose to be a leader and we can do it in our authentic way. Sure, we can borrow tactics from people that are successful. I've certainly learned to be a become a better speaker by studying Steve Jobs and the list goes on and on. But I learned a long time ago that if I don't show up A, knowing who I am Mm -hmm. and being willing to work on the things that need working on. But if I don't show up as my truest self, which requires the knowledge and the awareness, then ultimately I won't be believed and I'll, I'll eventually not reach the potential for what I'm trying to do, whatever that is in the, in the given moment when I'm leading. And so I think this, again, is one of those um, powerful chapters Mm. where she uses a simple story to make an incredible, poignant point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you're for us, I think it, it, you know, the lead with humanity, cultivate leaders. If you're not cultivating leaders, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we, you know, management, quote unquote, versus leadership, quote unquote, if you're managing, Mm -hmm. I hope you're working the leadership angle, right? Like, I hope you're doing that because what you're doing is you're, you're teaching someone to be empowered on their own without Mm -hmm. you, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And she says at the end to kind of 
go on that point. She said the old way to lead is with in vulnerability and to enlist followers. And honestly, I think that's that's certainly what I was doing yeah. prior to the twenty six percent approval rating, which well. you know basically led us to this podcast. But she says the new way to lead is with f- full humanity and to cultivate a team of leaders. And I think as leaders, if we can see the leader in every single person that we are working with, walking alongside, yep. if we can see them as leaders, sometimes before they can see it in themselves, then that is our role to help foster that. And again, that's what spoke to me heavily in this chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. Mm-hmm. And that leads us to the final chapter, Mm -hmm. chapter eight, which is find your pack. So old rule, you're on your own. New rule, you're not alone. You've got your pack. Yes. And she gives a a, 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 a kind of a humorous story about she retired and she literally took herself out of working out for three years. She said her body was just beat. beat Yeah. Yeah. And so she, when she decided to get back in shape, she started to run kind of solo and she had an accountability partner, but they weren't running together and she hated it. And so she just was beating herself up over it. So she finally says something to Glennon, like, what happened to me? I used to run, I mean, I used to work out six hours a day as a professional athlete. What happened? And, and Glennon's like, it, you know, she's so poignant I mean, she's, she's so so wise beyond her years. I think this is Glennon Doyle. We're talking about um, her wife and she said, Abby, you know, you used to run with your teammates. And then Abby started to realize, wait a minute, yeah, that's what I loved, being with them. Even if we were bending over, we were hurting together, we were laughing together, but we were together. And she's like, I realized. seven-like statement. It is. I wasn't wasn't with my wolf pack. And, you know, she says in the book, and again, she's speaking specifically to women, but I think you could make this universal, is that whether you're a mom, a college student, a CEO, or a little girl, you need a crew of brave and honest women to support you. You need them to hold you accountable to your greatness, remind you of who you are, and join you to change the world. And again, I think that could be heard or read in a more universal way. But in this instance, you know, she's speaking directly to women um, as a woman. And I, I love to think about that because there is at times where being a leader can, and, and we've talked about this, but you know, can be lonely. And sometimes that's self-inflicted, that loneliness. Yeah. And it was for me. And when I learned to be less lonely, which required a lot of vulnerability, mm-hmm. it required me to learn how to trust others, is that finding your pack is important. And my pack is a lot smaller these days, but it's definitely along the lines of people that I know are going to hold me accountable, people that are going to remind me of who I am when I get off course. They're going to be able to say things to me like, D, you're totally in your one right now, which is where sevens on the Enneagram go in stress and when we're um, unhealthy. And I can immediately, if I can't see it in myself, then I have people there to hold me accountable. And that's truly who your wolf pack is. And that doesn't have to be a massive amount of people. It can be a small group that can be your wolf pack. And um, I think that when we can consciously think about that, then we'll be motivated to have more meaningful connections with people. Yep, And we, We're at a place never before, and definitely in my 50 years of living, where we have more tools and language to learn how to to foster those meaningful connections and relationships. And so it's it's a great way to end the book and is to for us to think about who is our pack. That's right. And to really evaluate that and and to look for that when you're moving forward and establishing relationships. Yeah, I think, you know, when I was thinking about this book and just applying it. You read it. You said you've read it three times. This is my second time to read it. What surfaced for me this time is 
as people have been working remotely and doing the Zoom thing and now they're emerging back into workplaces and Mm -hmm. hybrid schedules and all these different things are happening, right? Culture is a big concern for business leaders. And for me, it felt like the the close of this book really brought that home. Like, well, this is what we want. This is what everyone strives to have is a team that feels like they're together, mm-hmm. that they're a part of this pack. Yep. So would you say that this was a, a good book like for culture? Did it surface for you that way? You know, it's interesting. There's, I think there's, a, I pull different things from it. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I think it has to do with where you are in the moment when you read it or listen to it. And I've done both Mm -hmm. numerous times is, you know, it is a book about leadership. Yes. Certainly that's, there's always something to learn from a leadership perspective because she's such an incredible leader throughout her career. And certainly since then, since her career ended and her new career took over, which, you know, she started a leadership foundation or or institute. And, but I think the book is about emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. And giving us a lot of cues on how to lean into the EQ that we so desperately need more of. And in fact, we're going to do our next episode is actually going to be on emotional intelligence. And she doesn't say it necessarily specifically in the book. But what I hear from her is that through most of her career, she lived by these old rules, as did many of her heroes, potentially. And then a few didn't. And I think that's where she was able to start thinking. And in many cases, she had to go against, she had to create new rules. But I think, you know, she realized what the new rules were that she potentially leaned into, but that needed, that we need to be thinking about moving forward. And I think that came from inspiration, again, reflection, thinking back on her career, her role as a bonus mom, you know, her, her role, um, in, in the life that she's chosen. And so I see, again, it's, it is a book about leadership, but it's, it's, it's really about changing our mindset. Mm -hmm. So I think if we think about that, then, um, you know, it's, it's how we can show up as a better leader, team player and a team player. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the, the, and culture is definitely a thread throughout the book. And I know it speaks to you on, on the level of culture, but what I know for sure is that if you have people showing up in your business, your community, Mm -hmm. you fill in the blank, your soccer team, your church, if you have people showing up in these eight ways, then I can promise you, you have a healthy culture Yeah. because, um, again, I think that if we're, if we're following these rules, these new rules, we are definitely going to be in a position to show up as the best version of ourselves. And so therefore we'll have a positive contribution. And if a culture is defined as a collective way that people behave, then this book is certainly one of, it is a, a, uh, a fast track to, uh, a healthier healthy culture. culture. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. And it's one hour. Right. And $8. So easy. Yeah. So no excuse. No excuse. $8. $8. So easy. So we. <laughs> and even cheaper than that if you buy it on Audible. Right. Because so, it's on a great note, listen. You're going to invest in books for our whole company. Everybody at the company is going to get this book. And yes. then we're going to do sort of a book club where we're going to read it. We're yes. going to read it out loud together. I can't wait. Everyone's, That'll be great. I think everyone's going to love it. But mm-hmm. getting everybody on the same page is really the motivation. Like, I want people to hear this and feel the way that we have felt. Absolutely. Reading this for the second and the third time. Uh-huh. And uh, we hope that you enjoy it, too. So for our music moment, right. let's get down to brass tacks about this karaoke situation. <laughs> okay. What songs, what songs are you thinking about? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean... Y'all have expectations. We do. Yeah, I, I have a reputation. You gotta, and I've got to live up to that. Yeah, that performer of the year, <laughs> that CMAs. Isn't that what it is? The CMAs. Well, yes, but that performer probably doesn't mean much to our listeners. Yes, yes, it does. One of our one of my dreams was to become entertainer of the year, and um, so I'm not. I am entertainer of the year of you of, are. of this. Team. this team and so For sure. i will probably you know i'll do some of my faves or y'all's faves i should say proud mary will definitely 
make an appearance. You and I will do a duet. So I don't know if, what we're feeling tonight. I know. Let's we're going to do shallow. Let's or... see after a glass of wine. Ooh, what about we've got tonight? We've, we've got, got tonight. tonight. No, that could be love fun. It when we sing. I know y'all love fun. it. Y'all need to turn it up when we start singing. That's right. <laughs> or yes, or not off. I hope. Yes. Uh, depending on this crowd, you said this is kind of a bougie karaoke place that we're going to and if it's a rowdy crowd i might bust out with some dixie chicks and not ready to make nice a rowdy crowd oh my gosh and get some angry chicks yes in the mix get some yeah adrenaline going love it yeah no this is no joke this is it's actually quite close to where we work and it's like it looks like American Idol. It's just mm-hmm. in Dallas, not in LA. So I can't wait for you to see it, like all the lights. And I think there's like a screen behind. I don't know. This could be fake news again. I yeah. I, I, I have these idealistic ideas, but no, for sure there's a raised stage all right. where you're going to be standing up on it. <laughs> and I hope there's a big crowd to listen. Okay. That's- well, I don't know. I think I might go down the sentimental track and see if I can make Marcy cry. And Ooh, yeah, you know, fun. two moms of graduating <laughs> graduating students, I might bust out with you're going to miss this. You're going to miss this. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, no, it's uh, who knows. But I'm excited to sing with the team, and we're we're just going to have a, a big old time. Good. So and we'll be sure to report back. We will. Everyone who's listening on how that goes tonight. I'm sure a lot will show up on our social. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yes, for sure. And you're, you're Why Not Fresh on Instagram. So if you want to see some fun stuff, follow That's Why right. Not Fresh. That's right. All right, Why Not Fresh. Are you in the mood to give away things today? I am. Okay. I am. All right. What do we think we should give away? We think we should give away some of these books. Yeah, like, I, yeah, let's, let's give away as many as people want i love it i mean it's eight dollars and it's it's a game it's literally one of the best investments that you can make and i think it's one of the best books that we could give anyone and um so let's yeah let's give some books away all right so we're gonna put some details um this is a call for jesse dear jesse please put some details on social media (laughs) and we'll put them in the show notes and uh yeah let's I think y'all should make it a goal to make it hurt. So Ooh, make it hurt. I know we'll probably ask for you to tag us in a particular way. And if you already have the book or you've already listened to it and you want to get it for someone else, we're happy to buy any number of, of books as, as, as people want. So let's, Sweet. Uh, again, let's, let's get after it. Come and get it guys. That's right. Get your book. All right. So note, you guys know this. We put a lot of show notes um, in our in the show notes <laughs> yeah, on the website, <laughs> on the website. Yeah. And you can get those at any time. We also have a plethora of other episodes for you to enjoy and listen and learn from. We thank you for your time today. Absolutely. We thank you, Abby Wambach oh. for writing this amazing book as if you're listening, but if you are call us, we want to talk please. And for being the badass that you are the badass. Yes. Thank you for that. And mm-hmm. we send you into the week with grateful hearts. Goodbye everyone. As always, you can connect with us on Instagram and Facebook at Self Smarter Podcast. You can also leave a rating or review if you enjoyed what you heard today. Not only does this mean so much to us, but it also helps other leaders and future leaders find our community. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us in becoming Self Smarter. This podcast is produced by Snacks Media and music is from a free platform. Well, that is until Brandy Carlisle reaches out to us to write the original score for our podcast. Friends, have a great rest of your day.